You know, one of the things about uh, crossing the Red Sea <laughs> is when we got to the other side, and there stood Andrew saying, I got a three-tape series on how to be a water walker. Since we're talking about age, uh, <laughs> when God said, let there be light, the angels lit the candles on Andrew's birthday cake. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of history around here. Well, it's a joy to, to be here. and. I do want to thank Andrew for uh, inviting me to be a part of something that God is doing that's awesome. And it's not just here, it is around the world. And every time I uh, stand up here, I just think what an awesome responsibility uh, to share the Word of the Lord with people who's going to go out and change the world. And I'm just uh, very humbled and really don't know what I have to contribute. Uh, it's been an awesome few days. I'm telling you, I've been ministered to by all of the speakers. Uh, Greg kind of stole my thunder, teaching on the Holy Spirit. I do a course here and on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, back in the, in the early days when God was beginning to speak to me about what He wanted me to do in life, it's amazing how you can see things and you don't know how to, to understand them or put them together. But you know, I really felt like back then that God was going to use me to reach a lot of people. And when you, when you kind of get that witness in your spirit, you begin to try to figure out how is this all going to take place. And so the limited understanding I had at the time, I thought, well, I'll probably uh, end up traveling and holding crusades and ministering to a lot of people. But you know what? Through this Bible college and through the correspondence course, this course on the Holy Spirit has reached hundreds of thousands of people around the world. I haven't seen them with my physical eyes, but I know it's happening because everywhere I go, I run into somebody that's taken that course. It's amazing. I was in... Uh, Argentina last year, and there was a young man there, and this was really blessed me. He was a student in our Bible school in Argentina, but he was from Russia. And uh, his family had moved to Argentina to get away from the oppression of the communists uh, back in that day. And he came to Argentina, didn't speak a lot of, of, of whatever they speak in Argentina. <laughs> I started to say English, but they don't speak English there, so whatever they speak, Argentinian, I guess, uh, whatever it is, uh, he struggled with that language because he was still speaking his native tongue, but he was riding a commuter train to work, and uh, there was someone on the train heard him uh, talking, and they struck up a conversation and found out that he was from Russia. and. Uh, she said, well, I have a gift I want to share with you. And somehow she had gotten a copy of my series on the Holy Spirit that's been translated into Russian and gave it to him. And he got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost and was, was a student in our school in Argentina. And he said, if he ever met me, he was going to buy me the best steak in Argentina. And he kept his promise. And I had steak in Argentina because of a Russian translation of my course on the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Uh, by the way, I'm Wendell, that's Greg. <laughs> Greg, would you stand up to, so they won't believe that we're the same person? <laughs> now, 
I don't see any resemblance whatever. But I have people come up to me even after this week and said, boy, that was a great message on the Holy Spirit, Greg. So I quit trying to explain. I said, well, thank you. I really appreciate the compliment. So I, you know, I, I want to be like Greg. And so uh, I'm going to tell a funny. But I hope you'll laugh at it more than I laugh at it because, you know, Greg always laughs at his jokes more than anybody else. (laughs) There was uh, these three men. There was a Jewish rabbi and a Hindu holy man and a lawyer. And they had become friends, so they were taking a trip together. And their car broke down. And so they began to walk. And they were kind of out in a a deserted place. But they saw a a farmhouse. So they walked up to the farmhouse and knocked on the door. And the farmer answered. And they said, our car broke down and it's getting dark. Would it be possible for us? Do you have room for us to spend the night? He said, well, I've got room for two of you to sleep in the house. But one of you will have to sleep in the barn. So the Jewish rabbi stepped up and he said, well, I'll be glad to sleep in the barn. So they all settled down and in a minute there was a knock on the door and the farmer opened the door and it was the Jewish rabbi. And he said, I'm sorry, there's a pig in the barn and I cannot sleep under the same roof with a pig. Well, the Hindu holy man said, well, that's okay. You you stay in here. I'll go sleep in the barn. So the Hindu holy man went out and in a few minutes there was a knock on the door. And the farmer answered the door and and the Hindu holy man said, I'm sorry, but there's a cow in that barn and I can't sleep under the same roof with a cow. And the lawyer said, that's okay. I'll go sleep in the barn. So he went out. Everybody went to bed. In a minute there was a knock on the door. And the farmer opened the door. And there was the cow and the pig. (laughs) And he said, I can't sleep under the same roof with a lawyer. (laughs) So, (laughs) hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Give you one other revelation here. If you have a white cat, don't buy a black shirt. (laughs) Some of you get that revelation later on in the day. Well, I I agree with Andrew. I enjoyed the praise and worship this morning. It was really special. Uh, You know, it's, it's, there's always uh, a uniqueness and it's amazing how God can take different things and minister to different people in different ways. But I really enjoyed that this morning. And, and it blessed me. It ministered to me. And uh, I think it gave me the right direction to go in what I'm going to share. And it's just a comment that Daniel made. And, uh, but it's something that's on my heart. If you would go to John 16, uh, verse uh, number 33. And this is the one that, that Daniel quoted this morning, but I believe this is the direction the Lord would have us to go. And uh, as you're turning there, let me just say to those of you that are considering Karis Bible College, this is a good place to be. It is a good place to be. And not only for the students, but for the staff. I'm telling you, we, we, uh, I get to associate with some awesome men and women of God. And uh, God is just doing something awesome in the world today through Karis Bible Colleges around the world. And we have, like I say, over 70 locations. And I remember when we started, I remember that day very well when Andrew, uh, there was only, he said, we had the staff in, it was me and Don Grow. We were the staff. (laughs) And uh, Andrew looked around to 
Don and I said, either one of you guys know how to start a Bible school? And I thought, man, I just left 18 years of successful pastoral ministry to come to work for a man that doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> uh, we were visiting the other day. We had some, some event here and we looked around at all the things God's doing and, and we both agreed it was probably a good thing none of us knew what we were doing because we'd have probably messed it up. And so I, I just love what Andrew's been teaching about the purpose and the plan that God has for your life and, and how he speaks to you and directs you. And, and uh, you know, it was just that inward change is what caused us to resign a church that we'd planted and, and uh, God had blessed for 18 years and didn't know what was before us, but all of a sudden our desire to stay there and pastor just went out the window. And we knew we were supposed to be here. And so God has a way of communicating with you if you'll just listen. John 16, 33, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. This is just before he was going to the cross and he had gathered his disciples together because he knew they were going to have a difficult time with what was about to happen. Even though he'd been trying to prepare them for that event, it hadn't really sunk in what was going to happen. And so he was bringing them in and, and communicating with them and, and also communicating with us about how we're to function here while he's still there. Okay. And so he calls them together and he starts off and he, and uh, he gets to this verse and he says, these things I've spoken unto you that in me, you might have peace. Now, before we read that any further, we need to stop and think a minute. What were the things that he had just spoken to them? And so you have to go back to, to John 14, 1, where he began this discourse with his disciples. And the first thing he said to these disciples and to you and I, let not your heart be troubled. Now, if we didn't say anything else this morning, there is something that you need to spend some time meditating on and realizing that you have a choice of how your heart is going to respond. Because he says, let not your heart be troubled, which tells us and indicates very clearly that we have a choice and whether we're going to have a troubled heart or we're going to have a heart that's not troubled. It's up to us. But then he goes on and he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So the first thing he assures, not only his disciples then, but you and I today, that we can have peace about is our future. Folks, he's telling us our future is in good hands. It is well taken care of. Matter of fact, the future that he describes is out of this world. Hallelujah. That went right over most of your heads, but uh, I'm not going to stop and explain that. But he was telling us that he's gone to prepare a place for us. So you don't have to worry about your future. You can have peace about your future if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he's been working on this place that he's prepared for us. And he said, no cabins in the corner of glory, in spite of what's being sung in a lot of churches, nothing but mansions. And these mansions that Jesus is preparing, and remember while he was here on earth, he was a master carpenter. So can you imagine what that mansion is going to look like? Now, these are beautiful buildings here, and I, I just, every day I walk by the new auditorium over there, and I look in, and I just see what a, what a beautiful, wonderful place that God's provided for us to come together and worship Him. But it's nothing compared to the one that we're going to receive when we leave this life. Streets of gold, foundations of precious stones, gates of pearl, I'm telling you, your future is well prepared. And you know, a lot of times we get, we get carried away and, and, and get all occupied with what about our future here? Well, this future here is very temporary, but the one that's being prepared is eternal. 
So he starts off uh, ministering to them and to us that we don't have to worry about our future. You can have peace concerning your future because it's well taken care of. And then he begins to teach them next about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he says, it's necessary for me to leave and it's going to be better for you that I leave because when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he is going to, he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. And when he comes, he's going to abide with you forever. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, different Christian persuasions, denominations, however you like to label it, that are, are afraid to teach people about security. Jesus wasn't embarrassed or afraid to talk about security because he said when the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in you, he's going to abide with you forever. Meaning you're never alone. So he's taking care of our future. And then he says, and I'm going to take care of your daily life because I'm going to be with you by the spirit. And you'll never be by yourself. And when he comes and he begins to teach them about all that the Holy Spirit is going to provide for us. And of course, one of the first things we understand that he provides is God's ability in us. And whatever God asks us to do, he's already given us the ability to do it. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Let me tell you, if we understand the Christian life the way the Bible teaches it, you and I are involved with the Lord and what he asks us to do is just no sweat. Now, there's an Old Testament uh, type and shadow of that very statement. When he told them to make the priest's robes out of material that wouldn't cause them to perspire. So, what are you saying? If you're doing it my way, it's no sweat. (laughs) Hallelujah. And when we're walking with God and, and allowing the Holy Spirit to minister through us and to us, it's no sweat. He has given us the ability to do every single thing that he asks us to do. We don't have to do it in our own ability. And and the, the beautiful part about all this, Jesus gave us a clear example of how that is supposed to work. And throughout his earthly ministry, he testified, the son of his own self can do nothing. It's the father in me by the spirit that enables me to do what I do. And then he turns around and he says to you and I in this same portion of scripture, he says, and that same spirit that enabled me to do what I do is going to come and take up residence in you. And so what I do, and this is the way he said it, the works that I do shall you do also. So he's setting the stage for us in these chapters, telling us that the life he has planned for us to live He's going to live it through us if we allow him to by the Holy Spirit. And yet, isn't it amazing how much of the church world doesn't acknowledge or recognize the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life? Do you know in the church that we read about in the book of Acts, you couldn't even wait on a table unless you were full of the Holy Ghost. And now we allow men to, and women to stand in the pulpit. They don't even know there is such a thing as the Holy Ghost. You know, I started off as a Southern Baptist pastor. And when I read over in, in Acts at Ephesus where Paul came and to these disciples, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And their answer was, we've not so much as heard whether there be one or not. They were Baptist. <laughs> Hallelujah. (laughs) But these chapters and all of this and, and, and the majority of the teaching he was doing here before he left was about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, why was he telling them this? He was telling them that these things I've spoken to you, that in you, in me, you can have peace. Peace because I've got your future covered. I got your daily life covered. It's, I've got you covered guys. And he says, so you don't have to, 
You don't have to worry. You don't have to let your heart be troubled. You can operate in peace. But that wasn't the end of the verse. Because then he changed. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. And then he changes and he says, but in the world. Now, most of us realize we're still in the world. We're not of the world, but we're in the world. Are you with me? And he made the next statement. He says, but in the world, you will have tribulation. This is what Daniel mentioned earlier. Now, let me see if I'm in the right place. How many of you have ever had a problem? Let's see your hands. How many of you ever had a, had a burden or, or a situation or a circumstance or a difficult time, pressures, burdens, whatever you want to identify? This, that word tribulation encapsulates all of those things, just saying in this world there's going to be some hard times. And you know, for whatever reason, and I don't know if you experienced it, but I kind of... Uh, coming to know the Lord, I think that it seemed like the message that was being presented that if you know Jesus, all your problems are over. Now, I don't know that anybody ever directly said that, but that's the impression I got. Well, it didn't take long to wake up and realize that was not true because problems seem to increase. And the more you make a commitment to the Lord, it seems like the more problems begin to come, Right? Well, six of you agree and the rest of you, <laughs> you shouldn't be asleep in the first session. <laughs> and I know you're not going to sleep in the next one because Lawson's up. <laughs> and if you're not careful, he'll run around and spit on you and wake you up. I'm telling you. In this world, you will have tribulation. And then the next part, he says, but be of good cheer. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning because I don't want to make a bunch of liars out of you. (laughs) How many of you, the last time you had a problem, cheered up? (laughs) Now, I have had some Bible college students who are very enlightened, very spiritual, have all these great revelations. I had one come up to me and said, well, you know, uh, uh, Brother Parr, that word cheer up really doesn't mean cheer up. (laughs) I said, oh, it doesn't? No, it means to be encouraged. Thank you. (laughs) So uh, let me ask you this question. How many of you, the last time you encountered a problem were encouraged? Do you realize that's not the natural reaction to a problem? But God is trying to get something through to you and I that we're not natural. That we are not to approach the things of life the same way a lost person does. And yet the majority of the Christian world, when they have a problem, do just like a person who doesn't know God faces a problem begin to wring their hands, pace the floor, murmur and complain and and cry out, why is this happening to me? Instead of being encouraged or cheering up. Now, the last few years I pastored, this was my counseling verse. Because I'd have someone say, get an appointment with me, come in, pastor, do you know what I'm going through? And then they'd unload on me about all the things that was happening. And I'd look across my desk and I said, well, cheer up. And that was usually the end of the counseling session. (laughs) Saved me lots of time. (laughs) But I'm just saying what Jesus said. Now he said, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you're going to have some difficult times, some problems, some situation. You're going to encounter some difficult people along the way. But be of good cheer. And then he says, because I have overcome the world. Now, the first time I read that, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, if you can't be honest in Bible school, where can you be honest? 
But the first time I read that, you know what my response was? Well, good for you, Jesus. <laughs> but what about me? <laughs> I mean, you, you already out of it. I can see why you would be of good cheer. <laughs> I've had those kind of conversations with the Lord. You know, I, I have not lived the life that Andrew has lived. I wasn't as bad a sinner as probably Greg was. <laughs> one as good a sinner probably as Andrew was. I was just a mediocre sinner. <laughs> but when I began to read the Bible, I saw that when I became born again, I became a new creation in Christ. And that all the old that used to be had gone and all the new that is of God had come. And I really began to get an understanding of who I am now in Christ. And so I, you can be honest with God. You might as well be. He knows what you're doing anyway. It's amazing how many people think God doesn't know what's going on. And you say, well, how could you say that? Because I've heard some of your prayers. And you have to explain to God, well, Lord, do you realize what's going on down here? Do you realize all the things we're having to fight? God, I'm sure you don't understand. No, he understands. And he says, be of good cheer when these problems come because he's overcome the world. But that didn't, that didn't really satisfy me because I was confident and I was rejoicing in the fact that Jesus had overcome the world. But you know, he's out of here and I'm still here. So he took me over to 1 John chapter 5. So if you'd like to go over there with me, there's a couple of verses that as I was explaining this to, to the Lord that he wasn't here and I was, and I'm glad he overcame, but I'm still dealing with this situation. And so we went to, he took me to 1 John chapter 5 and uh, he made me read these verses. Now, when I say made me, he inspired me. He led me. He revealed to me. He, he communicated with me. In other words, he said, read these verses. <laughs> and 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Then God asked a question, and the question is, who is he that overcometh the world? Well, you know, immediately we would want to answer, well, Jesus, you just told us you overcame the world. But that, God gives tests different than we do here at Karis. <laughs> we ask questions, we don't give you answers unless you pay attention when we're teaching. But God asked the question, who is he that overcomes the world? And then he gives the answer. He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now I'm going to ask the question. Anybody in this room, is there anybody in this room that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Could I see? Wave at me, shout, do something. I think that's everybody. The reason I was looking is we, if you don't, we can change that with an altar call here in a minute. If you don't know Jesus, you can. Amen. He has made it available to all of us. But every one of you, I believe a hundred percent, and probably those of you that are, if we're live streaming, uh, you can answer the same question. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Then according to the very word of God, God who cannot lie has now declared that you are a world overcomer. Now, now listen to me. Now when you go back to John 16, 33, you can finish that verse off with this. I can, when I face difficulties of life, when I face a problem in life, I can be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. 
based upon the truth of the Word of God that you, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're a world overcomer. Now the key for that to become a reality in your life is just back up to the last part of verse 4 where it says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You're going to have to believe you're a world overcomer if you're ever going to be a world overcomer. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. You know, when I first went into the ministry, for some reason, I had this strange idea that as I continued to understand the Word and teach the Word and preach the Word and live the Word, that there would come a day that I wouldn't have to have faith anymore. <laughs> I mean, if you know, you never get there. It's always going to be a faith journey. <laughs> You're going to have to believe it because God said it. And you're never going to get it if you just try to do it in your head. Because a lot of things you're not ever going to understand with your head. You're going to have to understand by faith. But God has said you're a world overcomer. Now, you know, he didn't stop talking about us then. Now, I'm talking about the new creation. Over in Revelation chapter 1. Let's go there and I'm going to going to throw something at you that you don't often have thrown your way. In first, the first chapter of Revelation, I'm going to reveal to you this morning who the Antichrist is not. It's not me. Now, I don't know about anybody else in here, but it's not me. Go with me to verse 5. Revelation 1 5. And it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Let's stop right there and see who he's talking to. How many of you believe that Jesus loves you? I think that's everybody. How many of you believe you've been washed in his own blood? So we know by, by identifying that who these verses are written to. Okay? We, we have to settle. Who is he speaking to? And we've just declared we believe that Jesus loves us. We believe we've been washed in his own blood. So we know he's talking to us. And the next verse says something to us. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, the church as a whole, and, and yet there's, there's still a large portion of the church. When I refer to the church, I'm talking about all of those that are born again. I'm not talking about a denomination or a building. I'm talking about those that are truly born again, they make up the church, the body of Christ. And the church, for the most part, and I don't, don't have any way of having an accurate percentage, but those of us in the circles that probably we've traveled in, we've, uh, there's been a pretty good job done of teaching us about the priesthood of the believer. Now, we realize that, that when we talk about priest. Uh, under the old covenant, these were a particular group of people that God had selected and, and gave a position so they could, they could be ministering at the Lord's altar. And basically they were the go between, between God and the people. And so to approach God, you had to go through a priest and all the priestly duties that were assigned as you read about in the Old Testament. But we know that under the new covenant, when God decided to come out of the Holy of Holies, he tore the, the veil and the temple in twain and he stepped out in order that we could step in. And we understand that now he has made us all priests that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and help in time of need. So we understand this and then Peter even amplified on it and said to us that you are a royal priesthood. Now, a lot of times we don't grasp that terminology royal. 
But it, it comes about because of the same verse of Scripture that not only did he make us priests. Now, once again, let me settle it for all of us. We do not need any fleshly man to go between us and God. We have an open invitation individually to come boldly to, into the presence of God. And the reason I said in the beginning, there's a large portion of the body of Christ hasn't got that yet, and they still think you have to go through a man. Pray for them. <laughs> they need their eyes open. And let me tell you, I just had some family deals <laughs> that I found out what, what a stronghold that particular group of Christians are under. It's pathetic. But you and I understand that we have been made priests. We are a member of the royal priesthood. And we can come right into the very presence of God with no condemnation. Amen. To come without any consciousness of sin and stand in the very presence of God. Now, now don't anybody misunderstand. I know his presence is always in us. But we use some of these human terms to, to present a truth, a spiritual truth. You know, I could say it better in tongues, but you wouldn't understand it. So we try to express it in human terminology. And so we understand the priesthood, but how many of us have ever really got the revelation that in the same verse he made us kings? Now I remember when we first started school. The first day Andrew got up and we didn't, <laughs> what do we have, 30 something students? And so Andrew got up and he, he began to share with the, the class uh, what he wanted to accomplish during the year, the things that he was going to teach, our goals that we were going for. And then he opened it up for a Q&A. And so I'm sure he thought they were going to ask some biblical questions, but the first questions that everybody wanted to know said, well, how do we address you? Do we call you Mr. Womack? Do we call you uh, Pastor Womack? Do we call you, how do we, how do we address you? And Andrew, as he would, oh, just call me Andy. <laughs> That's the way he still is. He's still Andy. To some, I, I have a little more respect for him. I call him Mr. Womack. <laughs> Always hold him in highest esteem. Never say anything bad about him. <laughs> awesome man of God. So the next class, he let me get up. And so I, uh, I shared what I was going to teach and went over the courses I was going to teach and what I'd like to see accomplished. And then I opened it up for questionnaire. And sure enough, first question is, well, how do we address you? And they went through the whole rigmarole, Mr. Parr, uh, Pastor Parr, uh, Brother Wendell. How do, I said, just call me King Wendell. Next day, they brought me a Burger King crown, <laughs> and I wore it. But, you know, we have a little fun with that, but I wanted this morning to really emphasize and drive home to you that God did just put these things in here for us to have material to read. There's a reason that he said that. And this goes back to a lot that's already been taught but it has to do with the authority of the believer. Now, those of us that were raised in the good old U.S. of A., we don't really understand monarchies. But I spent two years in England, and they, they have a monarchy. They have a queen, and she's been there. If Andrew thinks I'm old, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> she's been there forever. And uh, what, a, what a graceful lady. I mean, and I believe she's a believer. But anyhow, do you realize in her position, she has total authority over that entire nation. And you know what? You can't vote her in and you can't vote her out. Now, our country, you know, we used to have a country that the president had some real authority. For some reason, that's kind of degenerated down, and now he's kind of at the mercy of the two houses. But 
Anyhow, over there, the queen has total final say. She has absolute authority. And when she passes on, it'll be either her son or one of her grandsons that will step into that place as the king and he will have total authority and dominion. Now God set this earth system up for his believers, his children, his prized creation to have total authority and dominion. Amen. He gave it to Adam and Eve and said, look at everything I've created, you're in charge. Take dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, every creeping thing. Hallelujah, we got authority over creeps. <laughs> Need it more so today than ever probably. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, 17, I got to rush through this. This is the verse that says, by one man's offense, and if you'll read the whole chapter 5, he's talking about Adam. Because of Adam's sin, because of Adam's sin, his offense. Now, you need to get this straight. We all came into this world as sinners because of what Adam did. And because we were born sinners, we sinned. It's not the other way around. We didn't become sinners because we sinned. We sinned because we were sinners. Because of what Adam did. Now, this is so important for you to understand. By one man's offense, death, and you know, Death is a result of sin. So we could read that scripture and not do it any injustice saying because of one man's offense, Adam's offense, sin and death ruled, or we could say this, became king. Are you all with me? Was sin and death was in charge. But look at those next two words, much more. I love those words, much more. That's the reason I like to go to buffets. I mean, you can go to a nice restaurant and get a meal, but if you go to a buffet restaurant, you get much more. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can tell I practice what I preach. Hallelujah. <laughs> Anyhow, much more. They that have received the abundance of grace. I mean, you know that everybody in here this born again has received the abundance of grace because by grace are you saved. So we know now we're on the right track. He's talking to us. Those who have received the abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness. Now remember, we were all made sinners because of what one man did. Now we're all made righteous because of what man did. Amen. Hallelujah. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So we received the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. Now it says we shall much more, we shall reign and rule in life, the Amplified as this, as kings. Amen. Folks, you've got to grasp the fact that God has put you in a position of authority and dominion and the world's in the shape it's in because the church hadn't stepped up to the plate and done what it's commissioned to do. But bless God, it's being changed and you're part of that change. And go for it, you kings. Hallelujah. Jesus is the King of kings and we're the kings he's the King of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Amen. Amen.